After just a few days, the excavators come across the first victims of the disaster. The people of Pompeii have been buried under the rain of ash and pumice as deep as three meters. Their bodies left behind voids in the volcanic material, which archaeologist Giuseppe Fiorelli injected with plaster about 150 years ago, thus creating a dramatic impression of the moment of their death. Here we have the casts of two of the victims. Uh, very vividly, uh, this appears to be a man propping himself up on, on his left arm, and with his right arm, he's protecting the face of the woman lying on her back here. Uh, she seems to be pregnant. You see this great bulge here. And you see, too, the folds of the cloth, very sharp folds of cloth, all caught beautifully in the volcanic material. You see the folds of the cloth here, suggesting it's really rather heavy material. Mount Vesuvius is still one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. The most recent eruption occurred back in 1944, but rising smoke and gases are a sign of the volcano's continued activity. Giuseppe Mastro Lorenzo is a member of a team of scientists constantly monitoring Mount Vesuvius. The longer the volcano remains silent, the greater the danger of a huge eruption, similar to the one in 79 AD. Most people believe that there will only be a lava flow, but the next eruption will set off a huge explosion which is extremely dangerous for the people in the vicinity of Mount Vesuvius. Despite intensive research, it is very difficult to predict the next eruption. We don't know when the next eruption will occur. Under present conditions, Mount Vesuvius could remain quiet for centuries, but it could also erupt next year. More than three million people live within reach of the deadly volcano. Only a few skeletons were found at first. As a result, people were convinced that the town had been successfully evacuated in time. Actual events were much more dramatic. In 1982, Archaeologists discovered the remains of more than 300 human bodies. The victims had sought shelter from the volcanic eruption in the boathouses on the beach, where they were overwhelmed by the burning hot cloud of ash and gas. They lie there today, just as they did at the moment of their death. Pier Paolo Petrone works as an anthropologist at the University of Naples. He examined the skeletons just after the discovery. Here is a young woman. She was pregnant. She's sitting here leaning against the wall, and a young person, a boy or a girl, with its head on her shoulder. And here is a two- or three-year-old boy. He's lying on his right side. He was asleep, as all the children were, because the first deadly cloud reached Herculaneum at midnight. Judging from the positions of the unearthed remains, the anthropologist is able to draw conclusions about the precise circumstances of their death. Considering the positions of the skeletons, you can say that the people didn't consciously experience their death. All 350 victims died within seconds. They simply evaporated. You can't find any physical reactions, as you might see, for example, when someone died of asphyxiation. It was a thermic shock. They didn't suffer. They weren't even aware of what was happening. The people who fled to the beach underestimated the danger. One victim was still holding the door key in their hand, as if expecting to return home at any moment. The perfect bone preservation is a stroke of luck for scientists. Under the direction of Luigi Capasso, a large number of the victims have been examined at the University of Chieti. 
After 2,000 years, the nameless dead have been given back part of their identity. The skeleton with the registration number E22 is male and about five foot four. Clues to the victim's occupation can be found in his teeth. This person's teeth have something contradictory about them. The front teeth are severely worn down. The back teeth aren't at all. Apparently, the incisors weren't just used for chewing. They were also used for another purpose. The front teeth were worn down by a rope, which is typical of fishermen who use their teeth in addition to their hands when they make their nets. The analysis of the bone density gives some indication of E22's age. The man was about 25 years old when he died. Professor Capasso made another discovery in the man's spine. E22 suffered from brucellosis, an infectious disease, accompanied by high fever, nausea, and joint pains. Brucellosis is passed on especially by cattle, sheep, or goats. But the fact that the pathogen was found in a fisherman, as well as in other mainly fish-eating coast dwellers, baffles the experts. Of course, we ask ourselves why those fishermen so frequently came down with brucellosis. The reason must have to do with the economy or with the people's eating habits. We examined the food, and fortunately Herculaneum is an intact community. Not only did the biological human archive survive, so did everything else, even the food. The scientists focus on the eating habits of Herculaneum's population. In addition to reports which have been passed down over generations, the scientists also have ancient food, a situation which is entirely unique. Eggs, bread, and even fruit such as figs were carbonized by the burning hot cloud. In search of possible carriers of the brucellosis pathogen, scientists finally examine a piece of carbonized cheese. While examining the cheese with a scanning microscope, it became obvious that the searing cloud also preserved microorganisms. The scientists actually discovered Brucella bacteria in the cheese. The population of Herculaneum ate non-pasteurized cheese, and that is how they became ill. The skull of victim E52 shows a peculiar feature. This woman, who was about 25 years old, was wearing a metal hair accessory which melted in the course of the volcanic eruption. Due to a chemical reaction, her hair was also preserved. Under the microscope, we even discovered that parts of her hairstyle survived. And we found nits, the eggs of head lice. These parasites lived in their hair, and they were the reason for the scratch marks we found on all the skeletons. Two and a half centuries later, the gigantic building is still not completely excavated. Archaeologist Antonio de Simone's team had to remove thousands of tons of volcanic material to uncover the terrace and a few rooms. This is one of the tunnels dug by the Bourbons in the 18th century. This is the level where they found the main works of art, which are now almost all on show in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. 
By going through this tunnel, you could reach the room that was identified in the 18th century as the villa's library. The tunnels from the 18th century can no longer be entered. They are in danger of collapse. But by using the most modern measuring techniques and Karl Weber's documents, archaeologists have been able to reconstruct the villa in its original proportions. You have to realize that there's a difference of only 13 centimeters between the floor plan that we have made and the one made by Karl Weber. Just imagine, the building is 263 meters long. Weber's work was of sensational quality. But Alcubierre is unable to appreciate the conscientious work of the Swiss architect. On the contrary. Alcubierre complains to the king that Weber is persistently trying to change what the Spaniard refers to as our traditional methods of excavation. That Weber is digging tunnels just to study the architectural layout of the buildings. The Swiss architect would carry on digging even where there are no fines to reward the effort. Alcubierre urges the king to relieve Weber from his post. In the end, Alcubierre's scheming fails because Weber's plans are of tremendous value and his finds are spectacular. The bronze statues and the busts from the Villa di Papiri are now world famous. Still, during the 18th century, the treasures remain the secret property of the king and are kept locked away. All that Europe hears or sees are rumors and poorly drawn sketches of the finds from the lost cities. In 1758, Winkelmann decides to get to the bottom of the Neapolitan secrecy. In Rome, he has now advanced to become a respected art expert and antiquarian. He is seen as an undisputed authority. The royal court at Dresden is eager to acquire more archaeological novelties and provides Winkelmann with money and letters of recommendation. The scholar is certain he will receive one of the king's rare special permits to visit the excavations. But he experiences a rude surprise. His majesty will not even see him, let alone grant his wish and has him turned away by the guards. The Neapolitans are not interested in having their excavation activities made public. Winkelmann has been rebuffed. Yet not all the finds have disappeared into the king's private collection. At the Augustinian monastery in Portici, Father Antonio Piaggio works meticulously to decode a baffling discovery. Nearly 2,000 charred papyrus scrolls found in the Roman villa, their content unknown. When Winkelmann moves into the monastery after his rejection, he becomes acquainted with the priest and with his delicate work. Piaggio has constructed an extremely complicated uncoiling apparatus out of a pig's bladder, coils, and silk threads. Winkelmann realizes the charred scrolls were the books of antiquity. The papyrus rolls are the remains of what is presumably the largest library preserved from ancient times. Today the scrolls are kept at the National Library of Naples. An international team of scientists is trying to decode them with the greatest of care. text is about the consistency of burnt leaves. The mere touch will turn it to dust. Uh, uh, and if I sneeze, three more words of Cicero will be lost forever. The reason why only two thirds of the papyrus manuscripts have been deciphered after more than 250 years is not only because parts have broken off while uncoiling them. Some of the manuscripts are so badly charred that they cannot be read without